sometimes it's pretty amazing to me when God decides to do something. He doesn't do it part way. He does it all the way. I was uh, up early this morning and recording videos. And I thought posting them and getting things ready for the day. And did the news run, news services that I do. And I felt kind of oppressed, kind of a uh, malaise is the word. You know, it's just a, it's a good word to try to describe something that you really can't put a finger on. You don't feel sick, but you don't feel good. You feel kind of blah, you know, the blahs. And you just kind of feel out of it a little bit, but not quite with it. And, you know, it's just a malaise. And the scriptures had been talking about how in ministry that, you know, you're going to suffer attacks from the enemy, you know, and that you're going to be persecuted by your friends, you know, and that you're going to be challenged by all kinds of things. And so I kind of knew it was a spiritual battle. And so I kind of tried to plug along, you know, just keep working at, you know, posting and doing what I do, you know, in the morning on the ministry side. And, and finally, I just went, you know, Lord, I'm just whipped. I'm tired. I just can't do this. So I went to bed. I went back to bed and laid down. And man, I needed it. I was just tired. I'm still tired, but I needed a nap and it just, I, it knocked me out for a while, and I was amazed at the exhaustion that I felt, you know, and if you ever find yourself in that kind of challenge, you know, don't be embarrassed or ashamed to say, you know, don't do what you're doing. Just stop what you're doing and pull back, regroup, maybe even take a nap, you know, it might be that, or rest in some way. You'll find that place of peace where, you know, you'll feel more comfortable after you've done it. And I feel better. I still feel kind of, kind of worn out. I may have taken a nap this afternoon, but boy, it was challenging. I mean, I just felt horrible, man. But you know, it brings me on to something else. You know, have you ever heard somebody come up to you and say, or I should say write about you, well, that's not very humble, or you're not very humble, especially said to you after you take a stand for Jesus, or you say something about Jesus, you know, that the person doesn't like, and they go, well, that's not humble. In other words, most of the time, when I hear someone say or tell someone else that they're not humble, it's usually because someone has just been convicted by the Holy Spirit, and they, they seem to use that to try to counter what they're feeling, and try to tell you, if you were the one that's being told that, that somehow you're not holy or righteous because you're not humble. They think that to be used by God, you have to be humble or you're wrong, or that somehow you're wrong because you're not humble. I think you may find that there's times where you take a stand and that people have gotten so used to this phony excuse and this, pardon me, but anti-Jesus or anti-anointed, anti-Christ type of response that you might react in the wrong way when you haven't got a pride issue and you haven't got a problem with what you're saying or doing because you shared the scripture or you shared what Jesus has laid on your heart and you care about that person, so you have the right attitude. But they're coming at you in a way that they think will cause you to stop whatever it is that you're doing. One of the things I found that whenever people are trying to attack me personally, I ignore it. I go right on posting whatever it is. Like, recently I've taken up a position, and I think that's why I'm being so spiritually attacked, is that I've said that I have zero tolerance for the abuse and the use of children in ministry, whether it be in ministry or television or radio programs or videos or singing in church or whatever it is. I don't care. There is absolutely, in my mind, no justification whatsoever for a parent to take their child and stick them up in front of the public and make them a public spectacle on the Internet, on Facebook, any place, any time, any shape, any form. Because the reality of child pornography, the reality of child molestation, and those facts that are going on in our society are partially ourselves to blame. For we have put ourselves into the position of glorifying children 
and making them elevated into a position they were never meant to be. We were told and called to train up a child in the way they should go, and when they were old, they would not depart. We train up a child. We don't fame up pride in a child. We don't vicariously live through that child, say, oh, my precious child, and live our lives through our children. It's hard enough to realize that we are given these children on a borrowed schedule. These are God's children, not yours. You participated in creation in them. God allows you the ability to be the representation of his love to them for a short period of time. But they belong to God and they deserve to be given back to God if you are doing your job as a parent, not presenting them to the world to become idols or gods themselves. So, in that way, some people come to me and say, oh, you were so full of pride. And I say, good. If that be pride, then I'd be proudful of the fact that I'm trying to defend children from those parents which are abusing the privilege that God has given them to call them their own to do with what they want by being God makers rather than God givers, giving to their children the relationship with the Father that they should have. That Jesus said, suffer the little children to come unto me for such is the kingdom of God. We ought to be very, very, very over the top conservative with our children. For such is the kingdom of God that we would go and abuse them Confuse them? Use them? Jesus said better to take a stone and a millstone and tie a rope to it and throw it into a lake than to stumble one of these little children. If that be the case, that Jesus said, God help you if you're doing that and promoting that in any way, shape, or form. So as I had prayed about today with what was going on, I got up and as I looked at the videos that I've already recorded and things in ministry and it turns out that YouTube was down, which is where we record the videos and then pass them on, you know, and I went, wow, boy, it's just it's amazing, you know, there's this huge onslaught of attacks going on and, and I draw the conclusion that, man, taking this stand for the children's sake, you know, who will speak up for the little ones, help us and half abandoned. They've got a right to choose life they don't want to lose. I've got to speak up, won't you? And to take a stand for them, I can only perceive that Satan is really, or God, you know, the God of this world, that is, is really upset about taking such an absolute position that he absolutely is infuriated and has allowed powers in this world that be to assail those who are agreeing with me to take a stand for the children. Because I guess he wants to eliminate a generation by making them violent, selfish, self-centered, weak-willed, weak-minded, illiterate, irresponsible, ungodly. He can try. But as long as you and I have a God who's living and alive, then I think Jesus himself will suffer the children to come unto him. It is God which worketh in you. Not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think anything as of ourselves, but our sufficiency is of God. In other words, there is nothing that I can do that I would take credit for because it is not I that do it because I am the particularly, in particularly, most especially, one of those people who is totally dependent because of my health and my disability upon God. God forbid that there should be pride to the ego point of such that I would take away from what God has done and God is doing to somehow put myself into that position. I don't think so. Even in any video that there's ever been of, of me in recording, it is always the revelation of Jesus himself showing what he can do inside of a vessel that I happen to be participant in, watching as though from the backseat of my mind what he is doing as God is using this particular flesh and blood that could have just as easily been a donkey to communicate his word in the way he wants to do it. So I have, huh, what pride I have, I don't know. <laughs> God forbid that there should be those that think that I'm full of pride. God help them because little it be of me that I should see so much of myself rather than I see the Lord working in me to do what he wants to do irregardless of me.
No man can come to me except the Father which hath sent him, draw him, and I will raise him up at the last day. And I will give them one heart and one way, that they may be, they may fear me forever. Do not err, my beloved brethren. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and cometh down from the Father of lights, with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. Of his own will begat he us with the word of truth, that we should be a kind of firstfruits of his creatures. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Lord, will thou ordain peace for us? For thou also hast wrought in our works in us, all our works in us. In other words, God, give us peace so that we can do that which you've done in us and we could share what you've done for us, that you would be with us so we would be peaceful about us. So that way, when the enemy comes in like a flood, you will raise up a standard and allow us to rise above the accusations of the accuser of the brethren and even the accusations of the brethren at times that seem to work with the accuser of the brethren, which to me dumbfounds me to no end. How could you accuse your brother when you know there's one that does accuse? The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. In the way of thy judgments, O Lord, have we waited for thee. The desire of our soul is to your name and to remembrance of you. With my soul have I desired you in the night, yea, with my spirit within me will I seek thee early. I know that in me that is in my flesh dwelleth no good thing. For to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good I find not. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man, but I see another law in my members, warring against the law by mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin which is in my members. Bringing me into captivity to the law of sin that is in my members. The law of sin is in your flesh. You are bound by that law as long as the flesh is alive and well and you are living in it. But the law of the Spirit has caused you to receive forgiveness and mercy, grace and redemption by way of the sacrifice that Jesus has made so you can find atonement in that which God has done and you can't do for yourself. The flesh lust is against the Spirit and the Spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary one to the other so that you cannot do the things that you want to do. I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. Our sufficiency is of God, and my grace is sufficient for you. For it is not in your ability to stop sinning or doing what you think you should do, but God's grace will be extended to you for the sin that you committed in your flesh. That is, in this law of sin that works within our body, that wars against our spirit. As we grow, then we know that we sin less and less till the day that God presents us faultless before the Father with exceeding joy. So the day will come, very much so, where you will not sin. But I doubt that you'll be alive when you do it. <laughs> so until then, what shall we say? Shall sin abound? No. Much more grace abound. Shall we sin more than grace abound more? No. But that grace does abound to us in that God has given us his grace, which is sufficient for our sins, personal. So in and of that, since it is his grace that's been given to us, we have no source of pride. We have no ability of ourselves. We just receive from him mercy for mercy and grace for grace.